This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to this time of worship here at First Presbyterian Church on this Lord's Day, a beautiful day. We're glad you're here and worshiping with us. If you're visiting with us, especially we want to uh, welcome folks who are adding to our music today. Uh, our choir is on a retreat down in Salter Path, their annual retreat to go prepare for Advent and Christmas music. And David is always good enough to uh, make sure we have uh, wonderful mu musical support here to enhance and enrich our worship. And he's done uh, that this weekend by inviting uh, one of the top choral directors around, uh, Meredith Covington Clayton, to bring her uh, singers, the Meister singers from Garner High School, who uh, are arrayed behind me and some uh, out uh, sitting with you. We're grateful for their presence here. Uh, we, they've been with us before, and so we're always uh, glad uh, when they return to add to our worship. They are accompanied, and we will be accompanied by uh, uh, Deanna Boone Domre, who is on the piano, and uh, you will know in just a few minutes that you're glad she's here too. So uh, uh, music means so much to us in our worship, and so we're glad to be uh, um, have these folks here to enhance and support and enrich our worship today. Therefore, we're also glad, I know we have some families of these choir members here, and so we're glad to have you here with us as well. Hope all of you, whether you're a member of the church or visiting with us for any reason, we hope you'll sign the friendship sheets as they make their way back and forth along the pew. Uh, that helps us know that you are here. It helps you get to know each other. If you're sitting near someone, down the row from someone that you don't know, this will give you a chance to, to learn their name and perhaps greet them following the service today. Today's service actually will conclude with a very brief, uh, I hope, I think, a brief congregational meeting where we will hear a report from the officer nominating committee uh, with the uh, slate of nominees for the next class of elders and deacons. We do hope you'll stay for that. It'll be just a moment before the benediction. But if you look at the back of the bulletin, you'll see various things going on in the life of the church today. One thing that's not in the bulletin is that at 2 o'clock today, for anyone who's interested, uh, there's going to be a seminar really for our church members who want to go over to Campbell Law School. And one of the students there who also worships with us from time to time will be leading a seminar on things like living wills, uh, those sorts of things. So you're free to come park here at the church and walk over. Of course, Campbell Law is just across the street now. We've got a group already of about 10 or 12 who've signed up. But if you'd like to join with them, just be here a little bit before 2 o'clock this afternoon and head on over to Campbell Law School. Looking down the page, you see that the session and diaconate has their joint meeting. This uh, Wednesday night, we'll be meeting here in Memorial Hall and then breaking out to our separate meetings after that. The Adult Fellowship still has a few spaces left for their trip down to Newburn on Friday to see Tryon Palace and Gardens and also take a tour of the First Presbyterian Church in Newburn, which was built in 1800. It's a, a wonderful, old, beautiful church and uh, so that'll be a great trip. Emmeline Ketching is uh, coordinating this if you'd like to go on that trip and she promises that the gardens will be beautiful, extra special this year with fall flowers and I think they're in the midst of a geranium festival and so if knowing that you're going to see beautiful flowers enhances your desire to go we hope you will. They'll be leaving at 8 a.m. from the Westminster Presbyterian Church on Whitaker Mill Road. That's where the bus will depart. And so that's on uh, Friday of this week if you'd like to join the Adult Fellowship Group. Next Sunday morning is Consecration Sunday when we will be invited, all of us invited to bring our uh, estimate of giving cards, our pledge cards forward to place them in McFeeder's basket as an indication of our desire uh, to support and uh, sustain the ministry and mission of First Presbyterian Church in the coming year. Uh, if you have not received your estimate of giving card in the mail by now, uh, we have extras, and we'll, uh, we'll send one to you, or we'll have some available next Sunday. But we do hope you'll come prepared next Sunday to uh, give us an indication of your desire to support the work of the church in the coming year. This service next Sunday will conclude with a lunch, which is going to be... Um, kind of an engineering marvel to see how we're going to do that. Uh, uh, but the stewardship committee is committed to doing that. But what it's going to involve is 
those of us at the 11 o'clock service being willing to step out into the hall or out into the parking lot and enjoy some fellowship while this room is transformed from a worship space to an eating space. Uh, a, a meal together after on Consecration Sunday has been a tradition and the committee didn't want our upheaval to end that tradition. So I hope you'll come, I hope you'll stay, I hope you'll make a pledge and I hope you'll stay and eat because a lot of work and thought has gone into how are we going to do this. And so don't everybody go out into the hallway and leave uh, because then these hardworking folks will have set this room up and brought food in for naught. Please don't let that happen. So. Uh, um, now, in addition to taking care of your own hunger needs next Sunday afternoon, if you are so inclined, at 2 o'clock, after eating a nice lunch here, you're invited to participate in the crop walk, which is a crop, which is a, a walk uh, to address world hunger. And Carol Ann Mooring has been taking sign-ups outside. She'll probably do that also after the service today. But uh, the, the crop walk starts at the Marbles Museum. And I think it's a 3.1 mile walk, a 5K. This is one of those times when I say, you know, when I was a boy, when I, my first crop walk I ever did, uh, it was a 10 mile walk. Or at least that's what it was in my memory. Um, and I think it was mostly uphill, uh, I think. And, uh, but this is a pretty reasonable size walk downtown. It's pretty flat. And so if you'd like to participate in the crop walk or support folks who are walking in the crop walk, we encourage you to do that. Uh, finally, another way to address hunger in our community, uh, our FPC shares item that we're collecting this month is canned meat. We're trying to collect as much as we can to help stock the three food pantries that we support. And with the, uh, with the weather getting colder, sometimes utility bills going up, some families are put in a position to depend more heavily on food pantries, and so our participation in FPC shares becomes that much more important. So as you do your grocery shopping, I hope you'll remember those who do depend uh, week after week on the food pantries in our community. But we're glad you're here. I invite you to use the time of the prelude to continue preparing yourself for this time of worship.
please join in the responsive call to worship printed in the bulletin. Those who delight in the law of the Lord are like trees planted by the springs of water. They yield their fruit in their season. In spite of God's love for us, we often act in harmful and destructive ways. We close our hearts to God and disobey God's law. Together, let us confess our sin using the prayer confession in the bulletin. Our lives are out of order, O oh God. We esteem that in particular value. We count as precious that which will rust and spoil. We are extravagant in our pursuit of entertainment and personal happiness, sparing no expense when we are at the center of our concern. But when we are invited to deep investments in your kingdom, to share in work that is eternal, we hold back. We make careful calculations. And all too often, we refrain, fearing we won't have enough. Lord God, who gives us more than enough, forgive our skewed sense of value and our misplaced priorities. Keep us focused on your kingdom, that we might seek a glory before all things, now and forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord.
While it is true that we have sinned, it is a greater truth that we are forgiven through God's love in Jesus Christ. To all who humbly seek the mercy of God, I say, in Jesus Christ, your sin is forgiven. Thanks be to God. It was the great pleasure of the session this morning to welcome a new family into our church family as they met the Medfords, 
Aaron and Tiffany, and their young son, Jeremiah. They've been worshiping with us for some time now and have decided that this is the place they'd like to make their church home. Uh, just to give you a little bit of, and Alan Jessup is standing with them as their elder sponsor. Um, Aaron is a, a NC State trained engineer who now works for the Eaton Corporation. And um, Tiffany's like me. Uh, Tiffany has a political science degree, thought she was going to law school. Well, look at us. Uh, she's now uh, working in the development side for the American Red Cross, a uh, wonderful uh, organization. And, um, and their family, uh, a couple years ago, was enriched by the arrival of Jeremiah. So uh, that, uh, as, as we, we've, we've been celebrating here lately with, uh, with uh, young families joining us and wanting to kind of begin their new phase in their discipleship among us. And so uh, today we celebrate with the Medfords as they do the same thing. We've got some family here to celebrate with them, and we're grateful for that. And now, of course, a uh, reminder that this is now broader church family. And, uh, uh, and we're, we're glad to be on that journey with you. Today, uh, uh, Aaron is joining us by a, a transfer of letter from the First Presbyterian Church in Ashboro. Uh, Tiffany is coming to us by profession of faith and baptism, and then they together are gonna present uh, their son to receive the sacrament of baptism. So um, this will be one of the things that uh, mother and son get to share, and uh, this will be a significant day in their family life and in their life together. Tiffany, we're going to start with you. Um, let's, uh, why don't we come a little bit closer to the baptismal font? And you're not going to go far. We're going to keep you too. Um, I just have some questions to ask you. I know this is something you've given a lot of thought to over time and have wanted to do this for some time, and I'm glad to have the privilege now to share in this with you. The questions are, they're simple, but they're not simplistic. Uh, the first question I have for you is, do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner, and had God not sent a redeemer into the world that your relationship with God would be broken? Do you trust and believe that Jesus is that redeemer and savior of the world? Do you claim Jesus Christ is your own personal Lord and Savior? And do you now want to be baptized in His name and begin living your life as His disciple? Al, I think you have a question for the congregation. Our Lord Jesus Christ ordered us to teach those who were baptized. Do you, the people of the church, promise to tell this new disciple, Tiffany Elizabeth Hill Medford, the good news of the gospel, to help her know all that Christ commands, and by your fellowship, to strengthen her family ties with the household of God. If this is your promise, please say we do. We do. Let us pray. Lord God of grace and goodness, we know that you are here with us, surrounding us, caring for us. We pray that you will be particularly here with us in and through this water of baptism. As we baptize with water, O oh God, we pray that you will baptize with Holy Spirit and surround this disciple with your spirit drawing her closer to you, supporting her in her walk of faith, giving her the deep joy that is available to those who profess faith in Jesus Christ and who seek to serve Him faithfully and well. We pray your blessing upon this congregation that we might equip all those who will be disciples. Help us nurture faith in each other as we seek to draw closer to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Tiffany, Elizabeth, Hill, Medford, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and pray God's richest blessing upon you, now and forevermore. Amen. Now we're going to let you do something together, something pretty important which is to present your son to receive the sacrament. So I've got questions now for the two of you together. Do you take this opportunity to reaffirm your faith that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? And do you claim Christ's covenant promises not just for yourselves as individuals, but now do you claim those promises also for your son? Do you promise to love him and to pray for him and to teach him what it means to be a disciple of Christ? And do you look forward to the day, some years from now, 
when he will stand before a community of believers and profess his own faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you. Alan, you've got a question for us. Our Lord Jesus Christ orders us to teach those who are baptized. Do you, the people of the church, promise to tell this new disciple, Jeremiah Braden Medford, the good news of the gospel, to help him know all that Christ commands, and by your fellowship, to strengthen his ties with the household of God. If this is your promise, please say, we do. We do. And Alan, if you'll come hold the bowl. Jeremiah, can I hold you? <laughs> All right. Let's pray. Lord God of grace and goodness, as we receive this little one into our arms, we are reminded that he belongs to you, that he is precious in your sight, belongs to you already, that what we are doing this day marks his entry into the community of faith. We pray, O oh God, that as we baptize with water, that you will baptize with Holy Spirit, surrounding him, helping him to come to know you and love you and serve you. Equip him to grow in faith, hope, and love, that in growing as a disciple, he might bring delight to you, now and always, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jeremiah Braden Medford, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As I mentioned, he's got family members here, uh, but we have just become his family. His extended family, you, I'm not going to take you, I won't take you far. We'll stay right here. <laughs> We've just made some pretty important promises, and I hope every time we do this, we don't do, we just don't say we do because somebody asks you to say we do, that we take the promises seriously, just as these parents have taken these promises seriously. More than likely, we are who we are. We are where we are on our faith journey because someone kept promises on our behalf. Someone kept promises to raise us, to teach us, to love us, and to help us know God's love through their love for us. It is our sacred opportunity and our high calling to be that sort of community for this little guy and for the other children who are growing up in our presence. It is a deep honor to be able to be a community of faith for the children growing up among us as we seek to see their faith grow and develop and mature as they bring delight truly to the heart of God. Let us pray. Lord God of grace and goodness, we again we ask your blessing upon this family and upon this church family. We have made daunting promises today, important promises. Help us to keep them. Help us to be faithful. Bless these parents as they are engaged in the sacred calling of parenthood. And bless us as a church as we seek to share faith with the next generation to the glory of your name, now and forevermore, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let us sing together. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Don Martin. My faith statement describes how I strive to be a better steward of Christ. I believe in God, His presence today, tomorrow, and in the past. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that it was a miracle that He came to earth to teach us about God. I believe in the Holy Spirit that comes from the Father of the Son, together they are worshiped and glorified. 
I believe that God wants all people to tell others about him, Jesus' life, and the church. I believe that prayer is the way to talk to God and ask for forgiveness and a way to say thanks to him. What do scriptures teach us? The scriptures are from God. They teach us how God created the heaven and the earth and all things. They teach us the history of the world. They teach us about Jesus Christ's birth, life, teachings, death, and resurrection to save our sins. They teach us how God wants us to live. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. In my faith journey, I've learned to be a cheerful giver of my friendship, of my time, and my energy to effect change to all in need of help, whether they're in the Dominican Republic, Chicago, or downtown Raleigh. Thank you. Time to share our celebrations and concerns. Well, the celebrations will be that in another 12 years, little uh, Jeremiah will have written his faith statement for the confirmation class and will have to put on a coat and tie. <laughs> or a tuxedo, I don't know. Um, other uh, joys this morning, uh, we, of course, we're welcoming new members. Uh, we got some more inquirers. Um, among our old members, Arthur Farr told me this morning he had seen Dot Outlaw. She's at a care facility in Asheville and was uh, doing well. Um, Anna Jones uh, is still at Wake Med. She would celebrate uh, getting rid of her pain. She had back surgery and they have to keep working on her to try to figure out what's causing her back pain. Um, another concern this morning, Richard Boyette's mother is near death. Uh, he has gone to be with her in Ash County. Uh, you may have seen in the newspaper, the son of Dick Pearson died on Thursday at Hospice of Wake County. Roger Andrew Pearson was 46. Uh, his wife is Jennifer Campbell, daughter of Wayne and Peggy Campbell. Uh, some more joys. Uh, Ann Quarles and David Poisson, who met in the journey class, were married yesterday by Dr. McLeod over at uh, Peace College in the uh, Dinwiddie Chapel. Two uh, fine folks. And two folks that were married uh, just a couple years ago, Brian and Marjorie Lanier, uh, welcomed their first child. Luke uh, Byron Lanier was born Friday at Wake Med, almost nine pounds, a future Marine, <laughs> like his daddy. I was at uh, this pastor's retreat that I go to annually, also down at uh, the Trinity Center at Salter Path. Be glad you're here. The choir's down there getting eaten up by mosquitoes this morning. So. <clears throat> Hurricane Irene. But part of the, an icebreaker among us ministers and educators and stuff was we ask each other, in addition to your name and stuff, what's your favorite part of worship? Some of the answers were pretty interesting. One person said the declaration of pardon. Uh, others said the music. And of course, you can hear today why that would be everybody's favorite part. But some of the other ministers said silence. And there's precious little of it in church to just be still and know God. So... I think I will begin our time of prayer today with a full half minute of silent prayer so that you can enjoy some silence. Let us join together in a time of silent prayer. Creator God, it's our privilege and joy to gather to worship you in praise and thanksgiving, especially when we have so much to be thankful for. For the privilege of hearing musical excellence every Sunday when we gather together hearing music lifted as our very best offering to you. For the young people in our church, be they newly baptized like Jeremiah or like Donald Martin, 
key players in our youth group, on the front lines of mission and sharing their faith with others. And we're thankful for the opportunity to worship together with people who care about us as we join voices together in singing and praying and then listening attentively for your word in scripture and sermon. We pray this morning for those struggling with pain and sickness or dealing with the pain of grief. This church is a blessing to them when they hear from those who are inquiring about their health and well-being and who are praying for them. And so we lift our prayers to you this morning, loving God, grateful to be here and hoping to be able to do our part to keep this church healthy and well. We pray in the name of the one who was a healing presence when he walked among us, praying now as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I would invite the children to come forward at this time. If you'd like to gather around here on the, the carpet. We're going to talk about design this morning. Good morning. Some like to sit on the rug, some like to sit on the tile. Or you can stand up if you want to. Well, good morning. I want to talk about design today. Sometimes when you see something, you don't know what it's for or how it's used, but sometimes the way it's shaped gives us a clue. Let me, let me start you off with this one. What do you suppose this is for? A Duke cone. It's a Duke cone. What do you, you put it on your mouth and make your mouth go. Put it on your mouth? Oh, like this. So it's got a little end for your mouth or a big end for your mouth, whichever. <clears throat> and then it's so you can talk and say, go Duke, huh? It's also designed to irritate the Carolina fans, so it's, so it's <clears throat> it has multiple purposes. Okay, what do you suppose this thing is? A candle. A candle. Boy, you are good. How would, how would you use it for a candle? Um, you put it that way and you put the wax in there. And... You put the wax in there, and let's see if I got... Here, you do it. Well, how about that? Did you know that was a candle holder? And then, and then that one. And then you light the candle. Very good. Okay, I got one more test for you here. And then it's going to be hot. And then it's going to be hot and you don't want to touch it, right? What, what do you suppose this is? I'm guessing that's a bird. No, a, a, a place where you collect tips. A place where you collect tips. Okay, Ed, Ed needs one of these. <laughs> this is our newest stewardship campaign. If you all put the. <clears throat> that's a good. Some, there, there are places like that in restaurants. There are places to put it's tips. Box. It's a box. Yeah. Any other idea? Can you put things in it? You can put... Now, let me give you one more clue as to how this, what this is designed for. Now, that goes with this. Oh, what is that now? It's a, It's an African drum. A man in, in the church I used to belong to, Trinity, made this. Isn't that neat? You wouldn't have known that was a drum by its design until you see it all. And then see, these are designed sort of like a... There you go, Solomon. Okay. Well, what do you suppose... What about your design? You know, Jesus tells us to go help the people that are in need, to go help our neighbor. But how could you possibly see somebody is, is in need? How would you do that? Do you have any design features that would enable you to see somebody in need? How do you see Oh, you were designed with eyes. Very good. Or you could hear them saying, please help me. Um, if, but if, you, if you're over there, how do you get to them? 
What's your design there? But, 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 by, by seeing, by seeing how loud it is when, you, when, you, when you're walking. Yeah, okay. When you're walking. So you have feet. Is that how you walk? So you've been designed with eyes and ears and feet. And then if they, they need a sandwich, how do you get a sandwich to them? What do you use for that? Hands. 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 So, you know, I, I think, what do you suppose you're designed for? If you've got uh, eyes and ears to hear people? Hmm? Moving. Designed to move and so you can get over there. And, and what about that person in need? Are you designed to do something for them? What? Designed to help them. I think that's how we know what we're supposed to do. We look at our design. So you want to say a little prayer with me? I'll say it and then you say it. Let's, okay, let's pray. Dear God, Dear God thank you, thank you. For, eyes for eyes and ears and hands and feet mm -hmm. so we can see who needs help and go help them. As Jesus taught us. Amen. Now you can go back to your families, or if you're kindergarten through second grade, go to children's church. Let us pray. Lord God, may your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first lesson today comes from Isaiah chapter 45, verses 1 through 7. Listen for the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountain. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, men may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In that reading, we are reminded that as God is speaking to the king of Persia, that God is not just the God of Israel, God is the God of all kings and all kingdoms. The New Testament reading is a text that invites us to consider whether that God is our God and whether we have allowed that God to be our God. But before the reading, let me simply say that you, should have, you probably should know this is coming. Next week is Consecration Sunday, so this will be my one overt, no-holds-barred financial stewardship sermon this year. Uh, apologies to those people who are here with their uh, uh, young people in the choir, but if you go home and increase your giving to your local church, I will count that as a victory uh, as well. Um, but last, last time I preached, I preached on joy and the connection of joy and stewardship. I didn't preach last Sunday, so you, you were off the hook there. Next Sunday, I'm going to assume you're already here with your pledge card sealed in an envelope, and I doubt anything I say will cause you to open the envelope and change the number on the card. Though if you want to increase it, be fine for you to do that. Um, but this is my only real opportunity during this stewardship season to talk about the important role of financial stewardship. Some preachers shy away from these themes, which I think is a mistake, because I think what we do with our money speaks volumes about what really matters to us. And during this season, the church is simply trying to say that God and the work of God is supposed to matter to us most of all. 
So let's now turn our attention to the gospel of, according to Matthew, the 22nd chapter, beginning our reading at the 15th verse. Listen again to God's word for us. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with the truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And again, let us pray. God of grace and goodness, pour out your spirit upon us as we gather here this day, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'm sure I've told you my favorite Frank Harrington story. Frank, up until the time of his untimely death, was the pastor of the largest church in our denomination. When he died, Peachtree Presbyterian Church had reached upwards of 13,000 members. One Sunday morning, as he was leaving church, he noticed two of his elders standing on the front steps of the church in a rather heated discussion. And so, as their pastor, he decided to step into the fray to see what was going on. And so they immediately drew him in and decided to make him the arbiter of their conflict. It seems they were arguing about whether you should tithe your before income, before tax income or your after tax income. One was making the case that the tithe should be made on the after tax income. The other was making the case that you should tithe on your pre-tax income. And they were at loggerheads. So which is it, Dr. Harrington, they wanted to know? To which Frank Harrington said, Are either of you doing either one? (laughs) Are either of you giving 10% of your income to the church no matter how you calculate it? At which point they both looked down at their shoes and said no. Which means all they were doing was arguing for the sake of arguing, trying to score philosophical points. But neither one had actually made the spiritual practice of tithing a part of their devotional life. Neither one had allowed the spiritual practice of tithing to help shape their overall financial priorities. Before taxes or after taxes, people have asked me the same thing, and I don't know that it matters. Though this story today, the one where Jesus tells the Pharisees and the Herodians that they should render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God, some interpreters might say that this makes the case that since taxes are an unavoidable element in the living of society, that maybe we should take care of that first and then make our offerings to God. But that might be a stretch to use this text that way. Because again, I don't think it matters. What matters instead is the way we sort out our priorities. What matters is how we think about our deepest loyalties. What matters is who gets the lion's share of our love, our devotion, and our allegiance. To me, the problem this text exposed as I was thinking about it is that too many people think about what they give to the church in the same way they think about what they owe in taxes. All of us, I think, use every legal means available to keep from paying too much tax. We don't mind paying our fair share, but we don't want to pay more than our fair share. And almost everybody I've ever met thinks they're paying too much tax. But what concerns me is that this same impulse, the impulse to give as little as we can to Caesar, spills over into our way of thinking about what we're to render to God. 
so that instead of being guided by an impulse of extravagance or generosity or radical selflessness, we offer ourselves to God with cautious, timid restraint, which robs us, I believe, of the very joy that I tried to talk about two weeks ago. Do any of you ever watch the television program House? The setting is a hospital in Princeton, and the star of the show is an irreverent, cynical, painkiller-addicted, chronically unhappy doctor named House, who also happens to be a genius when it comes to diagnosing rare and mystifying diseases. He and his team conduct test after test, and no clue ever seems to emerge until House has this moment of insight, an epiphany at which he figures the whole thing out, prescribes a treatment, and saves the day. Well, on a recent episode, a person was brought into the hospital. This person had collapsed on the street, and none of his symptoms seemed to hold the answer to what was wrong with him. And what was most baffling to House was that the person was chronically generous. He was a millionaire, maybe a multimillionaire, maybe a billionaire, but he had decided that he could live on $25,000 a year, and so he decided to give everything else away. So he'd walk into a medical clinic or a soup kitchen and leave a check for a million dollars. He would hear about a need in another part of the world and send them a million dollars. Well, Dr. House was of the opinion that such generosity was crazy and that there must be a medical condition at the root of such irrational behavior. And it turns out there was. Turns out there was a nodule on the man's thyroid that was sending some signal to the brain that was triggering some hyperactive generosity. And so after a procedure or two, the man was normal again. Thank goodness, normal again. And by normal, I mean his first inclination now was no longer to see how his riches might ease hunger or cure disease or comfort the homeless or bring transformation to a third world community. Now he was normal again. And by normal, I mean that his first inclination now was to use his riches to tend to his own hungers, to add comfort to his own life, and to add to his collection of trinkets and toys. Though, a little side story in the show was how one young doctor watched this man's generosity and was captivated by it, saw something powerful and profound in it, and was hoping, I think, that it wasn't just a symptom of a thyroid gone bad. She was hoping, I think, that such generosity was a real possibility in the world. She was hoping, I think, that such a spirit of generosity could be normal, at least for some. And I think it can, but I think it's a learned behavior. I don't think we're born generous, but I do think we can become generous. And I think the people who learn generosity are, by and large, the most contented, joyful people around. For example, I heard a story a few weeks ago about a young woman who, right after college, traveled to a small village in South America to teach in a small mission school there. She knew it was going to be a sacrifice, but she didn't realize how much of one. She lived in what could only be described as a shack. There were no creature comforts that she had taken for granted her whole life. She knew her college friends were back home starting their jobs, living in comfortable homes and apartments, making more money in a week than the people in her village would make in a year. She wasn't very happy. The one treasure she held on to was a beautiful dress that her parents had bought her for her college graduation. There was no place around here to wear it, of course, but she took it out of her trunk every now and then just to look at it, to hold it, to put it on, to help her remember the world from which she had come and the world to which she would return, a world of comfort and beauty and richness and luxury. Now, she did grow close to the students and their families and became part of the fabric of this little community. 
And over time, she learned about a young woman in the village who had been widowed at an early age and who was now about to marry again, an occasion that brought great joy to the village. And this young woman about to be married came to the teacher, hoping the teacher could help her with a project of trying to turn one of her simple dresses into something suitable for a wedding dress. Well, you know where this story's going. In a moment of delirious generosity, the teacher opened up the trunk, showed the woman the dress, altered it to fit just right, and in that moment, she said, she discovered the joy of generosity. Sometime later, she told her pastor back home that this experience finally helped her come to terms with one verse in her favorite hymn that she didn't like. It's the hymn we're going to sing at the end of worship today, Take My Life and Let It Be. It was one of the first hymns she learned to play on the piano, and she loved it, except for the line that says, Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. She always wanted to skip that line, she said, because it seemed like it was asking a lot. But as she sat there with the other villagers on the happy occasion of a wedding, watching her dress, her precious, sacred, beloved dress being worn by another, she said she had more joy in that moment than she'd ever had in it before. Having the dress was nice, having it in the trunk was nice, taking it out every week or so was nice, but sharing it. And in sharing it, adding to somebody else's joy, that was the moment when she discovered the joy of generosity. The joy that comes when we learn to let go of what we thought we'd always hold on to. The joy that comes to us when we learn not to clutch too tightly our riches, but instead offer them up in gladness. Give to Caesar the things that rightfully belong to Caesar, but give to God the things that are God. Pay Caesar his taxes, but to God, to God give your love, your loyalty, your affection, your allegiance, your unwavering obedience, your whole self. Yes, you are citizens of Caesar's kingdom. Surrender to Caesar what you need to render to keep the roads paved, the schools working, and the firemen on standby. But to God, to God. Offer your whole self. Let your offering to God be an expression of worship and adoration and praise. Let the offering be your way of saying to God that God is at the center of your life and instead of looking for deductions and loopholes and reasons why this is just not a good time for irrational generosity, Think instead of God's own irrational generosity to you. Think of God's love for you and give in response to that and that alone. And give in a way that brings you joy. The kind of joy that you know when you feel it. Someone sent me a cartoon this week, a man standing in front of his preacher's desk dressed in a tiger suit. The caption was, the preacher saying to the man, Ralph, I appreciate your commitment, but my sermon said, I hope you'll all become tithers. <laughs> tigers, tithers, it's an honest mistake. church doesn't need more tigers. The church does need more people fully committed to supporting the work of the church. Now tithing is a wonderful standard, and, but the truth is some folks are in a position to do more than that. Some people are probably in a financial predicament that a tithe would put them in jeopardy. There's nothing magical about the tithe except that it is a guide to help us offer ourselves sacrificially and substantially to the work of Christ. 
I've never had the courage to do what Ed Bowen did for more than three decades of ministry in Pittsburgh. He would challenge his folks every year to tithe, to give 10% of their income to the church. And if at any point during the year they were at risk of going hungry or being evicted or being in any real financial peril, he said, come to the church and we'll return your offering to you. In 30 years, he said, nobody ever came to ask for any money back. Now, could be nobody ever tried it. Or it could be those who tried it never had to come. Because God provides. As I've said, I've never had the courage to offer such a bold invitation, which may say something about my lack of faith. But I've known a lot of honest-to-goodness tithers in my life, and I have learned from them that those who have discovered the joy of generosity are almost always on the lookout for ways to give more, not less. And they never seem to worry about any deficits in their lives because they are so focused on life's fullness. So, before taxes or after taxes, to argue about that I think misses the point. Just find a way to offer yourself to God in a way that responds to God's love for you and reflects your love for God. And in so doing, discover the joy that God is eager for us all to know. To God be the glory, now and forever. Amen. Let us affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us now rejoice in what we have been given and what is ours to give as we receive our morning offering.
If you can stay for, with, with us for the congregational meeting, please be seated. Um, if I see parents of young children who need to rescue them from nursery, I completely understand that. Uh, but other, this should, should be a fairly brief meeting as we hear a report from the officer nominating committee. And we're surrounded by the choir because they are going to bless us uh, after the benediction. So uh, um, we thank you all for staying here with us for a few minutes longer. 
Alan Jessup is going to serve as the clerk of the congregation today. Uh, Alan, does it appear to you that we have a quorum present? We can begin then. Let's have a word of prayer to begin. God of grace and goodness, pour out your blessing on us as we meet now as a congregation. We thank you for calling leaders forth and for a willingness to serve and to lead. We pray that you will guide this congregation into the future as we seek to be faithful to you in all that we do through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The one item of business for which this meeting was called is to hear a report from the officer nominating committee. Let me tell you a little bit of how this proceeds. David Worth has been the, is the chair of that committee. He will uh, give us the list of folks who've been nom or are, are willing to be nominated, both as uh, as elder and deacon. The floor will then be open uh, to other nominations. The way our procedures work, if there are nominations from the floor, we will suspend the meeting and then reconvene next week so that biographical information can be distributed uh, in next week's newsletter. Um, so, David, with that said, would you uh, make your report? Is it turned on? Do we Fred Crisp III, Amy Gray, Bruce Ham, Tom Hogue, David Kesterson, Dan Roebuck, Scott Summerfield, and Tom Talbert. The following persons have also have been uh, agreed to serve as nominees for di on the diaconate, and that would be uh, Dana Barnes, Mark Brown, Ken Carmike, Susan Hammer, Becky Hester, Brenton Hopkins, Philip Jacobs, Karen Johnson, Daniel Johnson, they're not related, uh, Carol Newell, Doug Redford, and David Wainwright. And that's the uh, group of people that the nominating committee have come up with as nominees for their respective offices. And I would put that before the congregation in the form of a motion for you folks to vote on. Thank you, David. Those names are properly before us. Uh, any nominations from the floor? Seeing none, I take that as a uh, desire to move ahead and to vote. Uh, all those in favor of the motion that these persons be elected as elders and deacons for the class of 2014, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. That motion carries. Those folks are duly elected. Their ordination and installation date will be set for sometime in early January. Uh, we, the congregation is in their debt for, in the debt of the, to the officer nominating committee for doing this hard work and for these folks being willing to answer the call to service when called. Uh, this concludes the purpose for our congregational meeting. Uh, Mr. Clerk, if you could let the minute show that the benediction today will serve as the closing prayer for this congregational meeting. Before the benediction, let me just say a word of appreciation again to these choirs, and let me tell you something funny that Meredith said to me before the worship service. She doesn't know she said something funny to me, because she didn't mean it as funny. What she said was, she wished that we had invited her choir here later in the year so they'd have more time to practice and sort of be more ready. If you were more, re if you were more ready, we couldn't have stood it. I mean, y'all, uh, you have blessed us by your presence, and, uh, and now, uh, it's according to the bulletin, they are going to offer a blessing following the benediction. So let us stand together to receive the benediction. Jesus came into the world to reorder our lives, to disrupt our loyalties, our loves, our affections, our allegiances, and to draw us close to God. To, to call us to have God at the very center of who we are. Jesus came to reorder everything about us that we might live our lives not for our own glory, but for the glory of God. Hear that call, that challenge, which is actually a blessing. And now may grace, mercy, and peace, the triune blessings of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you, with those you love, and with God's people everywhere, now and forevermore. Amen.